This is Movies, a podcast about the act of cinema. Season five, episode one. Hans, how are you tonight? What's what's the t-shirt this evening? It's uh, the guy from uh, Return of the Living Dead. Oh, yeah. Do you have any yeah, t-shirts I'm that sweaty. are just regular that's, t-shirts that's that are just, just, just a color or maybe a logo, a brand logo? It's always some no, 1980s like movie. No. Funko yep. Pop t-shirts. Yeah. Hey, we got Robbie and Nick back on the show Pop tonight. Piece of shit. <laughs> What's up, guys? Hey, guys. How are we doing? Oh, fuck yeah, dude. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, uh, we, get, we, well, we were just talking about your background, Nick, and I, had, I was completely bewildered when you told me this was from Space Jam. I never would have predicted that uh, in a million years. Robbie, your background also from Space Jam, presumably. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's uh, Nicholson Joker. You can't see Nicholson, but he has his hand on the Heath Ledger Joker, and he's Hell giving yeah. advice. Go get him, brother. I'm trying to think of a better. I'm trying to find a better background. Boy, I, I really like the Kumia bro. one you started out with. You should go back to that. Oh, okay. He's friendly. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think that's the one. <laughs> uh, people who are not watching this right now and only getting the audio version on Spotify or iTunes are really missing out. So uh, let me just do the promo real quick. Patreon.com slash lowers. You can see Mel Gibson and Vince Vaughn accompanying us <laughs> um, dude i if i ever get famous i'm falling in with the fucking republicans i want to hang out with mel and vince so much more than i don't know timothy chalamet or whatever man i just got some really exciting news about something i can't reveal on this show tonight regarding ben shapiro's company and uh hans oh, knows shit. what i'm talking about and uh, I, don't, I don't i don't know if it would be as interesting to you I guys if i if, no don't 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 say a word we don't want people to get in trouble or get fired did you but, find out his real height <laughs> <laughs> is it five foot five is it is it over five foot five <laughs> we've got a uh, we've got some friends right. who might be working on one of their projects that they've got going on right now so there's some mm. there's some interesting news that will come out probably within i, I would have to assume this month there's going to be some leaks. Very unexpected, too. Extremely. Very, uh, yeah. You would never, never even guess. I'm so curious. Yeah, drop I, it. Like if drop I, it in if the I chat. If I give you 100. Right. Yeah. Hans, drop it in the chat. We won't say anything. If I, okay. Yeah. If I give you 100 guesses, you would never uh, get it. This Damn, is ben actor. Is going to save the movies? He, uh, dude. Uh, he uh, could. Honestly, I'm very optimistic. I'll say that. This is real. This is a real thing. Hans oh, just leaked it. Yeah. It's yes. Yes. <laughs> Wait. What? Legit. And uh, Hans, you want to just you know let them know what he's doing in that movie, what yeah. he's up to, his his naughty deeds. Um, this has nothing to do with. Uh, no, 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 <laughs> no, Hans. We it's we worse Dude, than that. Ben Shapiro. Not that guy. D you you know. I, I'm going to have to type it out. No, I'm just communicating vaguely with Hans. Anyway, I Ben Shapiro. Yeah, okay. just... yeah, just you do it. I'm, I'm one of the movie brats. I'm going to rescue the cinema. It's, what, what are you going to do? The movies right now are horrible, <laughs> and I'm going to make them good again. The left hates... I don't know. <laughs> I, didn't, I, wanted to, I, wanted to, I wanted to riff on this, but it's a secret. Oh, yeah, hell yeah. Oh, right. I yes. really want to riff on this. Wait a minute. It's too funny. Hang on. He he did this. This person that you're talking about did this in a movie before. There's a movie where he does. Oh, never mind. I, Interesting. Whatever. Wow. Yeah, I'll have to, let me look it ben up. Ben Shapiro, by no, the I, I can't say anything. I'm going to spoil it. Uh, he signed Will Smith for Hitch 2. <laughs> Kevin James. <laughs> Kevin James is the main character. Yeah, but he plays the neo Nazi <laughs> in, in that other movie he did in, Hitch, in Ben Shapiro's Hitch 2. <laughs> Was that any good, by the way? What was that? that went completely under the radar for a guy with so much money to act in that, that kind of movie? Yeah, that sucks to take a big swing to play a neo-Nazi and just get no attention for it whatsoever. You know what I mean? Like it's like usually people do that because they'll get Oscar nods, but I think that you know people just well, unless you're Mickey Rourke, that. right? Oh, Mickey Rourke did, play. What's the movie? Did he play a Nazi? You loved Loris? Oh well, we we really get to talk about this show at some point. We watched the movie. Well, I watched the movie. I don't know if you watched it yet, Hans, but we're going to talk about this oh, for yeah. certain. One of the best movies I've seen in a long time. A little film called Night Walk, which is about uh -huh. Sean Stone, who is Oliver Stone's son, who is a devout Muslim and Trump supporter and Stop the Steal guy. Uh, who is My mom kind of knows him. Really? How funny is that? 
Yeah, my mom is uh, Afghani, and apparently he's obsessed with Afghanistan. So he's like, I have to meet you. <laughs> uh, what I've what I've learned about him is that he went over to the Middle East and then de- decided, like within three days, that he was going to convert to Islam. So that's the type of guy Sean mm. Stone is. In this movie, I think it takes place in like Turkey, and he gets arrested and he's locked up, and then he gets transferred to Los Angeles. And there's still a lot of Turkish people in that prison, even though it's Los Angeles. And Mickey Rourke plays the one Aryan Brotherhood guy. There's no Aryan Brotherhood gang. It's just literally Mickey Rourke. He cruises in and out of scenes. He looks like he's like just making up his own lines for every single uh, delivery he's giving and then eric roberts pops into the last 30 minutes and he's definitely drunk and uh he's got (laughs) there's like no no relation at all to the rest of the movie uh he also just seems like he's making up his lines off the cuff and it's the single most entertaining film i've watched in maybe three years it's entertaining because that i'm not gonna lie that cast is like pretty intriguing to me yeah, I'll watch anything Mickey Rourke's in. Mickey Rourke never doesn't deliver. He's, he's in the best great. Marvel movie. You forgot to mention he has a giant swastika tattoo on his neck. Yes, that, that's the case as well. But also for like a member of the Aryan Brotherhood, he's very tan in this movie. It's modern Mickey Rourke <laughs> who loves applying tan. So he's just brown skin and saying racial slurs. He drops some hard R's. He's a member of the Cholo KKK. <laughs> <laughs> hey, a Holmes. POC. I got, I get catorce words. <laughs> but this movie's terrific. I, I can't recommend that enough. If, you, if you're into like so bad, it's good. This exceeds that. If it, I mean, you could just watch the last 30 minutes with Eric Roberts alone, and that would be a feast in itself. Dude, uh, how about, uh, I, I got to watch this. How about Clerks 3? Uh, I'm, tr- I'm trying to get some work on that, actually. I'm oh, sorry. I'm stuck. <laughs> I'm. Uh... They don't see our episode when we just shit on Kevin Smith for like two hours. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. If you want to unlist that, that. Yeah. <laughs> dude, I'm actually. I actually want to do a show at the Smod Castle. Oh, that's I'm right. Trying to get he's, that going. He's opening a theater up in New Jersey, right, for podcasting yeah, and next to, next to the Quick Stop. Oh, and on Twitter, fuck. he's like, he's like, if you want to do a show here. <laughs> submit here i'm like all right I'll oh, do- dude, that's it's gonna be like bam margaris house in like three months i guarantee <laughs> yeah that's so depressing know. that really bums me out that he got the boot from jackass forever and they're he w- they got restraining orders because when, when we were kids bam was the coolest one he was like the i mean he was kind of a laughing stock but i watched fucking viva la bam like he he was a huge part of that thing and you, you, i mean your tweet was right on about it where it's like it is missing something without him because the stars were Knoxville, Steve-O, and Bam. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And how do, you, how do you say no to putting, like, my favorite thing to watch, I love his fucking Instagram lives. Why wouldn't you want to, like, throw that on a giant screen? How do you but, not want Bam in the movie? I heard he was on meth, and they, they booted him because he was on meth. I fucking put it in. I mean, how is that? It, that seems like such a strange line to draw when you look at the content of the jackass legacy, like the films and the shows. Well, well you can kind of get ja- you can get the vibe from this new trailer. They're going in a different direction. Where it's like, oh yeah, remember that from when you were a kid and it's hokey and it's sentimental, and they try to like make you know make you have warm feelings for jackass. Which I mean, look, people had that anyway, but you don't need to lean into like this familial approach. Yeah, yeah, but I will say the. Jackass wasn't just it, like the best part about it was just like those guys and how charming they were. Like that was like such a big part of why it was oh, yeah. fun was it was like, oh, I feel like I'm hanging out with my friend. I think that that's what they're kind of like. Like, I actually think the I was super skeptical, but then I watched the trailer and I was like, oh, yeah, this is this is fun because it is like, oh, man, my good friends, Chris Pontius and Johnny yeah. Knoxville. This is it's why like, you like I'm... Space Jam. Yeah, I, I love seeing my friend Bugs Bunny. Like literally, I haven't seen, I haven't watched any, I've not watched any Looney Tunes content since the Brendan Fraser movie. So I was like, oh fuck yeah! I remember Daffy, my f- old friend. It's uh, it's Practical Jokers before Impractical Jokers, right? I mean, that's that's what yeah. it is. I mean, it's all like the same. You know, that's what all podcasting is really too. It's just like, oh, it's a oh a group of fr- a virtual group of friends. You know, right. Right. And uh, anyway, t- t- tonight we're going to be talking about something that is uh, not wow. even close. No, no, my, no. Space Jam or Jackass or anything me, me. that has preceded this conversation. How dare you say that about my good friend Mishima? 
<laughs> I love check. I love was checking back in Jam? with. <laughs> yeah, what's up? Clock, you? Look in the what's about to say? <laughs> the Clockwork Orange guys were though. The Clockwork Orange guys were in space. Yeah, they're yeah. The Droogs are in Space Jam. There's a bunch of like R-rated, X-rated properties in Space Jam. It's yeah, bizarre. Space Ghost was in it. Yeah. Was it like? Yeah. A, did they have an actor play Space Ghost, or was it CG? No, CGI Space Ghost. CG. Oh. So that's that's the most egregious thing. Is everything's in 3D except for there's one scene where it cuts to the Monstars from the first movie, but it's it's just the animation from the first. Oh. They're 2D. The, they just you didn't bother. plucked it. The 40 minutes where the Looney Tunes were in 2D, I enjoyed. I didn't yeah. like when they turned 3D, but I I like seeing like 2D. I was like, oh, shit, a $200 million 2D animation movie. Like, you just don't see that anymore. So I, I, that's that's what I like. And this just yeah. sounds like a like a trip to Six Flags. You know, when you it see is. everybody dressed it, up yes. as, like, Batman characters. And, and, yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's, it's like if what if the original guys or guys that kind of look like Jim Carrey's The Mask played. But, I mean, yeah, it really is just a fucking trip to Disneyland. I don't know. Is Le- yeah. LeBron a worse actor than Michael Jordan? Yes. No, he's he, no, 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 no. Michael Jordan is much worse than the original. No, but no, Michael Jordan had that charisma, dude. LeBron, yeah. is, Le- he's charisma. No, Michael Jackson has the legacy. Michael Jackson is a bad. Like, Michael Jet, Robbie, you drunk? Or, sorry. He's bad. <laughs> <laughs> My, Michael Jack. <laughs> Michael, that, that's how Michael Jackson. Remember the scene in Looney Tunes where they have the magnet into the hole? Right. They get yeah. That's what Michael Jackson did to children. <laughs> he had like a magnet that got them into. Uh, and the hole was his ass. No, but uh, my. But Michael Jordan, if you rewatch Space Jam, he like he's objectively a worse actor than LeBron is. Well, LeBron's got all those episodes of the Barber Shop under his belt. You know, that's like hanging LeBron, out with friends too. LeBron is... can act on on a bad level, but on a level, Michael Jordan could not act. At, like when I was a kid, I didn't notice, but when I revisited as an adult, I was like, this guy just he like his bugs <laughs> you know <laughs> but in both of their defense it's hard for regular actors to act with cartoons right so it's like you know you're gonna do a guy who never acts to suddenly be like i oh my god i'm in an animated world like that's that's right, a pretty heavy right, duty right. uh work i mean you know that and that is the critical pro fundamental problem with the space jam movie <laughs> <laughs> well oh Tonight, we are going to be celebrating Paul Schrader's birthday. How old is Paul Schrader today? Does anybody know? Hans, you know. You're a big Paul Schrader fan. How old is Paul Schrader yeah. today? I don't know. 90 something. He's got to be in his fucking 80s, right? Oh, no. I think I don't even. I don't, maybe he's out. 70. He's got to be in his. Let me look this up. He's, he's And he's still so horny. He's 75, really? Yeah. Oh, he looks like shit for 75, honestly. <laughs> he, he always looks like he's shit. Horny? Do you think he's just horny but doesn't get hard anymore? So he's just like torturing himself, knowing he, that he can't get hard. He he's married. <laughs> well, I can't believe. It. You know, we live in a modern society, Nick. You know, <laughs> people come to these certain arrangements. That's you're right. <laughs> yeah, you're right. No, but I'll bet it's a great. I'll bet that he can't get like he he posts like a man who can't get any pussy. Right. So I'll bet it's a Can monogamous I? relationship. Can I just say one thing about about this movie? When when I was first watching it. Uh, at the beginning of the credits, it says that the Japanese script was written by Chaco Schrader, and I really thought that he just gave himself that name so he could sound more <laughs> Japanese. But it's apparently a woman that existed, so that's yes. cool. Uh, was, I, th- I thought that was his fr- wife. Oh, his brother's yeah. wife. Yeah, his brother's like an otaku, right? Because his brother also right. helped him write uh, the Yakuza. I think that mm-hmm. was like their first credit together. That's correct. Yeah, his uh, brother moved to Japan and then married some Japanese. Oh, woman. dude, his, bro- Paul, the his brother's a full-on gaijin. I love that. Yeah, this movie is uh, uh, truly a classic. It is like no other Paul Schrader film, and yet it is spiritually like most of his films. Well, thematically, it's right in line with everything. He, like, like it, it almost it almost communicates what he does. Like, it, it kind of takes what he does in a lot of different other movies and and. Br- brings it all together thematically but you're right it's not like any of his other movies visually or like yeah you know, on a film right this film. mishima character is not that different from you know travis bickle or uh you know uh what's the uh reverend's name T- taller Ernst taller, taller. yeah taller. Ernst, yes from uh first reformed or really any of the others uh rolling thunder you know just a self-destructive man uh on a mission know, on a, a mission. Righteous mission a very ambitious <laughs> mission uh i know you guys i mean when we did the paul schrader retrospective we kind of 
we kind of fucked that up because we skipped over this and Patty Hearst, and those are two of the most interesting, entertaining films that speak to today also. Uh, and I feel like, I mean, it's actually probably a good thing in retrospect that we didn't get into that because they are worthy of their own shows. Absolutely. Uh, especially this one. But have you guys seen Patty Hearst? I love Patty Hearst. I actually still haven't seen it. Ah, you got to check it out. Vinegar, Sy Vinegar Syndrome has a, a pretty good uh, transfer on Blu-ray. And okay. that is, I, I think that's one of the funniest movies I've watched in quite some time. Oh, okay. It is so okay. relevant right now. I want to be black. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I was fucking black. He gets very upset. He's looking at himself with black face in the mirror. That's just one third that's of people great. today. No, but uh, yeah, this is, I think, uh, on... On rewatch, I think this is his magnum opus. Absolutely. This is everything he's well, trying to say in every movie. He says the best here. Because, oh like, God. it takes... Because Paul Schrader is, like, three different modes. He has, like, he has... It's a lot of solitary man, but it's, like, the creative solitary man where it's focused on their work. It's the man on, uh, like, a mission. And then there's kind of, like, um, meta Paul Schrader. And this one kind of, like brings it all together and it's but it's a real guy so it's the it's the very rare serendipitous like completely serendipitous pairing of subject and uh filmmaker which you never fucking see usually a biop i hate biopics it's my least favorite genre because you never feel like the director has anything personal to say about it. they're just kind of bi biograph bi biopic in your life <laughs> but, yeah but, but paul schrader's like this is fucking perfect for him this is awesome i'm glad he got to make this yeah it's i don't even you're right i don't even think of this as a biopic but it, it kind of fucking is and it it's, absolutely it, is it's arguably i mean this is one of my favorite movies ever like easily top 10 and it might you're right robbie this might be the best biographical movie it's i think it's there. the one i like social network too but this oh, yeah, one's social really good. good yeah i think the artistry but, but, in this film uh outnumbers social network 10 times out of 10 personally I just like the visual flair that Paul Schrader implements here where it's not really called for otherwise um I think I, I mean I watched this movie three times over the first time I I did check it out I did the Japanese version I did the Roy Scheider uh narration I haven't listened to the uh I guess one of the photographers on the film did a narration as well for, I guess for, for whatever reason, when they re-released it in 2000 or 2001, uh, Warner brothers didn't have the, the Roy Scheider track. Um, Hans, I know you have a point, but I'd just like to ask real quick, do you guys have a preference between the strict Japanese, uh, vocals or audio track rather, or, uh, the Roy Scheider narration? I go for I've Japanese. Only, I've only seen the Japanese one. I, I I've never seen the Roy Scheider one. Is that Roy Schneider? That's not the guy. Oh, it's actually Ross, it's Rob right? Schneider did the narration. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Ma Making novels. <laughs> Being gay in Japanese. Yeah. Um, I, I thought um, I was up, watching Emperor? a movie about like a, a, a secretly gay Asian man that wanted to die, and I felt very identified with it for whatever reason. <laughs> well, that, that's what's great is he – he like Mishima, despite being a J gay Japanese artist, was the ideal incel. And yeah, that's why Paul Schrader was, uh, you know, it's the most inclusive uh, depiction of an incel of all time, perhaps. I, I also read something about there being another version where Paul Schrader. I've never been able to find it, but I swear to God, I read this. There's a version. There's a cut of this movie where Paul Schrader does the narration. And I, oh, want, God. To, I, I want to hear that. That so sounds bad. In, Paul, hold on. Paul Schrader should never now or Paul Schrader. <laughs> have you guys looked at Paul? I mean, any, any interview with Paul Schrader in 1970 to like 1985 where he has a lisp? Yes. It's so bad. And now, well, now he's got the lisp, but also like he sounds like he's constantly choking on his own snot. He's, <laughs> he's, I, I listened to his, his Fresh Air interview around the time uh, First Reform came out. Horrific just a bummer to listen to and i love him <laughs> and i can listen to hours of quentin tarantino <laughs> so that that shows you my threshold paul schrader i could i was like this guy needs to never talk this, i'm glad he's a writer and i listen I, to taxi driver i will say the taxi driver commentary he's a little it's not as bad i, I think it's gotten worse as he's gotten because well, he's always had 75 he was like 30 <laughs> no no but yeah. the commentary came out in the 90s or maybe the oh. aughts uh but I, his old, he has the worst case of old man phlegm I've ever fucking heard in my life. That's awful. It's that denture lisp as well, where it's a little, like, it's a harder edge uh, to it. It's not as wet. 
Yeah. Here's how I felt about Ethan Hawke. The, the Nimoy before he died voice. Yeah, yeah. I, I, it's not as bad as that, uh, I would say, or not as obvious as that. But I mean, he's coming to the table with just like a terrible voice in general. So it's easy to disguise that. Um, so we're going to be talking about this and we're also going to be talking about Yukio Mishima's short film. And I'm debating maybe we should save that at the end. I'll put that as like a little short bonus episode. Because uh, I don't know if there's going to be a whole lot to really say about that. But something I was thinking about was, you know, what is the evidence here that Mishima was indeed gay? Now, it's it's heavily speculated. There's certainly, you know, a lot of, well, a lot of things that would point in that direction. But do we know of any relationships that existed with this Mishima character? Um, and then I rewatched the short film Patriotism today, and he's got like a shot right around his hip near the pubis area and it's like yeah only a gay man could think of that kind of shot <laughs> so i don't maybe maybe he is gay i don't know Hans, you think he's gay yes okay me too you guys don't think he's gay robbie and nick all right defend that position don't put that on me i know i, I always uh, is there is there no i thought that he was um i thought he was gay i thought he was gay he's by his writer. own admission He's a writer. He's gay. If yeah, he's, you, gay. Uh, <laughs> he's a writer and an actor. He's a Fruit Loop. Yeah, yes. absolutely. No, I, I didn't. I didn't know that. Is there no hard evidence? Because I thought that. What, what did he? Wasn't that book? Yeah, um... I got some hard evidence for him. <laughs> 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 uh, I don't believe it was ever outright state. I mean, you got to think about it. Also, uh, I mean, 1960s, 1950s, yeah. anywhere, but Japan especially, uh, people don't want to hear that. I mean, even today. There's a lot of, ooh, we don't talk about that regarding, I mean, sure, the whole coup d'etat, you know, that left a sour taste in people's mouths. But really, the gay thing is real. It really gets them trying to avoid the subject of Mishima. Well, that's why uh, this movie was never released in Japan. Like, the, initially, it was only right. released in America because he, and I, maybe it was because, I don't know if it was because he was controversial or like asserting that he was gay was controversial. But I know that it didn't come out there for one of those reasons. I think it was a bit of both. I think, I I mean, if if you think about it, like, uh, obviously, politically, what he did was uh, more than socially taboo. And then the people who would probably be, you know, backing him, which was a very, uh, you know, right wing sect of Japan, they don't want to be, look, to to think that that guy's like Milo Yiannopoulos for 1960s Japan, that's (laughs) a a tough one to swallow. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) no, I mean, that's that's why Mishima is an incredible character, because he's a man of so many contradictions. He's a hard right wing, like he's a right wing nationalist writer. Like, like it, it's that's another th- reason why the movie is great. Is it kind of gives you this crazy like it's what a fucking crazy story that this guy existed. Like, uh, yeah, a guy who made it big through writing and through film and then like committed a, an act of political terrorism and killed him. Like, that's you a once in a was? lifetime fucking story. I think he had some kind of gay sex fetish with the emperor. I think that's what it was really all about. I think he wanted to reinstate an emperor and fuck him. I, yeah, I, look, all... I think I think that's as plausible as anything else. He seemed very fond of those young men in his militia. I think he was oh, happy as hell. Do you Definitely. Think, do you think that he jerked off on that guy's face while they were holding him down at the end of the movie and then killed himself? With uh, out of shame, just well, yeah. There's a lot of evidence to well, suggest he that he did that because he realized he was gay. Right. The minute the minute all the fucking army guys started laughing at him, he's like, "Oh fuck, I'm gay." Oh, I, <laughs> I must Akira myself. Oh fuck! <laughs> I stood oh. on a roof and started talking about my ideals. This is so fucking gay, dude. <laughs> dude is terrorism gay? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the 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 tragic thing, and I won't talk about the um the short patriotism too much, but watching it today, it and they cut it out of the movie. But Mishima's end is kind of like tragically comic as well because he like he his whole life was leading up to this moment. He was laughed at, total failure, and then he didn't even commit seppuku correctly. He took like eight whacks or something to finally oh, cut yeah. his head off. Yes, the guy and, did not have the stomach for it, and someone else, I believe, had to step uh, in and finish the job for him. Yeah, yeah and so the then stomach. 
for it. That's funny. And, and, <laughs> so then when you see in patriotism, like how poetic and beautiful the seppuku is supposed to be and how it's supposed to be like this ultimate act of like honor, it's like, it's like, God damn, that's such a, he really thought that was going to be him. And it wasn't, he had the, he had like the, the, the complete opposite of, 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 of you know, what his dream was going to be. That, that, was. that puts in, yeah, but that puts that that makes the movie so much more resonant because so it's so much about fan like the fantasy of writing versus reality in a lot of ways yeah that's like in the in, especially in how those sequences are shot versus like his past and his present which are more like like his present is shot very realistically and then like or very just kind of matter of fact and then the past is shot with a little bit of romance and then the, his writing is shot with like you know what i realized low res i don't know if we want to get into the movie at all but i realized uh uh, Million Dollar Extreme presents World Peace seems to have taken a lot of inspiration from the from the fucking fantasy <laughs> shot. Yeah, you know what? That 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 kind Holy of shit. It's one wow. to one. I completely yeah. realized it on this rewatch. All the fantasy shots. I was like, this is World Peace. Well, if you take a look at World Peace now, um, a lot of those shots. I mean, I wasn't as, I mean, I was pretty well versed on film, but I'm not as where I'm at now. And I think a lot of things uh, slipped by me when I originally watched that. And then when I revisited it, uh, maybe this past year and a half, I was like, oh yeah, they just steal from Brian De Palma and there's Michael Mann shot, like signature shots here. And yeah. so it's funny you would, you would reference this film in relation to that. And I can think about it in my head. And there is, there is certainly like a visual overlap there. Yeah, that's all. That's all. Sketch, Andrew the Roos. prison sketch. Yeah, Andrew. Yeah, yeah. But you know what? Much like Tarantino, great artist steal. Yes, that guy's. I was terrific. I was just watching. Yeah, Andrew Roos. Mm. Yeah, yeah, Tarantino think, is good too. I guess. Yeah, he's all right. Uh, <laughs> but Andrew Roos. I, yeah, I feel like they lost a lot of juice when he like drifted from the crew. Absolutely. Yes. I. I mean. I mean, we don't. He's have kind to get of the hidden genius. It. Yes, yeah, yeah, certainly. Uh, the uh, the visual eye of I think what might have been um, a lot of I mean I I think a, a thing that uh, a lot of comedy sketches succumb to unfortunately is just being a little too static, being a little too straightforward in terms of the visuals, and that uh, that guy certainly subverted that for for World Peace and a lot of those thanks computer sketches that they released in 2015 2016. Yeah, and Sam was a good editor, so yeah, and a good yeah. writer. But but speaking of what Robbie's saying, the uh. the set specifically, like the, uh, <laughs> the the fan the writing the fantasy sequences, like the sets, which like I think <clears throat> no 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 he does it in Patty Hearst too. There's a set in Patty Hearst when she's in the closet that's kind of reminiscent of Mishima. But other than that, this is like the only film that he has where he like plays with that kind of filmmaking, and it's it's like. I don't know. I'm I'm not being uh, very articulate, but it's just no, so I know, fucking I know what you mean. good, dude. And it's so it's so cool to watch. You never see him play with stuff like that in other. In fact, it makes me wonder if he had some help with this one because I, I I love Paul Schrader. He's great, but I've never like it's so different than everything else he's done, and feels much more epic and sweeping. And uh, even the choice of the soundtrack is so different than what he usually does. That you know, I wonder if there was a little. So well, what did, what did what did I mean, uh, Coppola and Lucas have to do with this movie? That's yeah. all right. So that was, that's what I was going to touch on is I know that financially they help bankroll this movie, but it does feel like maybe they could have offered some input in the creative of it because you're right. It feels nothing like anything that Paul Schrader had done to that point or really even since. Uh, now, a lot of the vignettes of Mishima's novels that are used to uh, de depict his life in different stages, uh, I, I, I mean... The whole idea of that is that uh, it's calling back to like a no stage, I believe it's called, where mm. it's a like kabuki theater, Japanese uh, uh, rakugo and like plays and this and that. And uh, I mean, I, it really uplifts everything in terms of uh, just the, the flair of this film. So, yeah, I, don't, I, I mean, maybe maybe it's just a bunch of coincidental uh decisions in trying to align with the Japanese culture that elevated this as a whole. Or, uh, yeah, there was a, a silent contributor who was maybe voicing their opinion, not dissimilar I, I from see. maybe Spielberg on Poltergeist with yeah, Toby I Hooper. See. I mean, I don't think that anyone, right. I think it's like, it's very much Paul Schrader's film, but I do see a little Coppola in it, at least especially in that time period. Well, it like, doesn't I don't really know about feel, Lucas. it doesn't feel like a Paul Schrader film though. It feels, it feels very Japanese for whatever reason, like everything, yeah, from, for, like, for whatever Japanese reason. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, I don't know. It's like a subtle and, 
Japanese aesthetic. You know, the, I can't really. The language they use sometimes. Uh, no, but uh, it doesn't really feel like any of the other movies that I've seen from him, at least. Uh, this this so also that, did feel. It felt like Paul the closest he would do to a, a prestige like Oscar thing too. Like it does feel like he's kind of gunning for the like mainstream a little bit. So maybe they kind of you know had their hands in that too. Like, yeah, but there was it, no chance. Nobody saw this fucking movie. There was no, no chance. Yeah, this was a anything. flop. No. Uh, I think the budget might have been three million, and it made five hundred thousand at the box <laughs> office. Yeah. That sucks. Well, yeah, I mean it would have you... been like a dark horse, but I think that I think they were like, oh, maybe there's a chance. Like. Coppola, uh, Lucas. This is these are big names, and it's a biopic uh, about Hollywood, not Hollywood, but a writer. So yeah, how but, popular uh, were not non-Americans in America in '85 though? Like non-American. Yeah, movies, that's the thing so too. People won't to... go see foreign films today. Uh, back in 19, yeah. what was it, 84, 85? Uh, 85. Yeah. Like the the audience for this movie, and you got to keep in mind too. Maybe he wasn't banking on Japan completely. Uh, you know, removing the possibility of that being released theatrically there. But I know he had trouble even in the lead up uh, and eventually with like Mishima's estate because his wife, his ex-wife was just completely, you know, delusional regarding the man himself and, and didn't want to hear a lot of the uh, homosexual elements that were in this movie. Mm -hmm. So the, the audience for this on paper is very narrow. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it feels like one of those projects where they just made it to make it. Mm. Yeah, well, I think it was just probably like it was probably a passion project for, uh, I mean, for honestly, Copeland Lucas is for sure what got it made in the first place. But it was it's, I mean, but it's I'm glad it was made. Like it, it feels like a movie that shouldn't have been made in in some ways. I mean, it would be it would totally get made today, but in the '80s, like. It, it's very anachronistic from a lot of like stuff that came out around that. Well, especially well, if you look at the movies that he released before that, like Cat People, American Gigolo, and Hardcore and Blue Color, completely, yeah, 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 nothing like this at all. Yeah, yeah, they're like and, genre movies, and this yeah. is like a very sweet, touching, like epic. Well, I think that um, the point of American Zoetrope was to kind of like push these more because Lucas and uh, Coppola didn't they also like <clears throat> they either brought. Kurosawa was ran to the states or like campaigned to have it uh selected as like the they 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 were trying to like push like better movies into like the American um cultural consciousness. I don't think they were very successful, but that was kind of like the point of this studio. Oh, I didn't realize it was yeah. a studio. Right. Yeah, uh, a production company. Did they had uh did they not have producer credits on Ran when that was released in the the early oh, 80s? Maybe they did. Let me look. Uh I don't know. Hmm. But I feel like they helped distribute it. I think you're right. Well, it kind of seems like this is the last of that. Because anything after 1985, uh, comparatively, anyway, feels, I mean, pretty generic from each of those guys. Uh, yeah. Rumblefish might be an exception. But, I mean, Coppola in the 80s is, is pretty rough. Uh, Spielberg obviously goes completely commercial. He does the Indiana Jones films. And then Paul Schrader, his career kind of gets to a lull by the late eighties into the early nineties. And he, you know, he's just kind of, uh, I mean, he's not a director for hire after that. Um, but the projects that he he's doing are, uh, really obscure and not getting the same kind of attention that they might've in the 1980s or 1970s. Paul Schrader is a very strange career. Uh, I mean, we've talked about it on our show, but it's like, so many ebbs and flows with how much cultural clout and acceptance he has and like the kinds of movies he's making like it goes so back and forth all the time it's very very strange his 90s are very weird too there's not one standout really uh i mean i comfort I, of I, strangers I, light sleeper touch, i challenge that affliction affliction is great mind. affliction okay. is very good and he did that one hbo uh fucking movie about uh like witches and wizards and Dennis Hopper's in that, right? I haven't yeah, watched that yeah. yet. That's that's no, something that I've been very yeah. intrigued by. It's a sequel to another movie that um oh, that was also directed by like a decent director. I can't remember. I'm I'm fucking autistic. But uh, it's called you know Witch what? Witch Hunt. Can yeah. can we can we speak a witch hunt? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Can, it's about the can Trump speak... trial. <laughs> <laughs> the, I I think that like uh, Mishima might be. I think it's his best movie. I think it's a perfect movie, but it's also like insanely timeless. Like there is something about this movie that like 
if you showed it to me and you, I mean, I could probably like gauge from like image quality when it was from, but I don't think I would know exactly when it was from. It feels if you like just fucking showed me this it movie. Al- it also feels like an immediate classic, but it just never got into any sort of canon ever. But it like when yeah. you watch it, you're like, oh, this should be. It's weird that it's not seen as like a great movie because you watch it, and you're like, oh, this is like an instant classic that everyone should be fucking talking about. Well, and even the fact that like elements of it, like the score, the score is so good. The Philip Glass oh, score. Oh, it's is an amazing. iconic score. Yeah. yeah. It, well, it's like, but it's iconic because of the fucking Truman Show, because they reuse it that's in the Truman right. Show. Yes. Oh my so God. that that's the I thing is, that. typically uh, when you do a score for a movie, you know, the there's a contract that's so signed honest. that says it's exclusive to this. They didn't sign that with Philip Glass, and so now it's used for every epic, cool, like big movie that's that's going to be released, uh, you yeah. know, from the '90s out. It's fucking good, crazy how that happens. Good evening and the good night. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, the score is amazing, and he uses it. Paul Schrader has a tendency to use the same song over and over and over in his movies. But the thing is, the score is so good that it works really, really well. Sometimes it's grating, like in Blue Collar, but in this one, it's like really, really like he it, it was like really well done. Yes, uh, it's, Martin it's, Martin Scorsese does the same thing, but with that one Rolling Stones song where it just comes up in every fucking film, well, he loves oh, that yeah, song dude. so much. At least much. Scorsese spreads it out over different movies. Schrader will have one; he'll get in his head that he has one song, like a, a song for the movie, and he'll just like cat people. He just uses it over and over and over. <laughs> Uh, blue cards like that. Oh yeah, the song that, that, that's that, that not over, bad man. to the bone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and there's other ones I'm not thinking of, but the the only movie I think where that actually works is Midnight Cowboy. Everything oh, yeah. everything else it it starts to get grating. American uh, Gigolo, yeah. Does oh well, yes. Me? Yeah. American. I mean, even that kind of wears on me, and I like that song quite a it's lot. A good song. Yeah. It, it's like forever intertwined with that movie and i think it might have been done for that movie right it was written for the movie yeah it, the original title was theme from american gigolo yeah it's like, a huge hit and yeah. this but this one works does he use a bunch of different songs or is it like it's a so score or is it a there's, whole score? it's a score and and there's some variations you've got the main like bum, 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 like that fucking but there's variations on it like my favorite track in the movie is this track called kyoko's house and it's it almost starts out kind of like this like 50s guitar that then like morphs into the score i love this i have this i've i've got i've owned multiple copies of the soundtrack throughout my life i think it's so fucking good <laughs> Do you um, listen to it while hugging your anime pillow? I that is what I do. <laughs> it, it, yeah, it is good though. Like half of the power of the film is the use of the music, in my opinion. And that's the other thing. It's a much more sweet and like epic and like a traditional score than I usually hear in a Paul Schrader movie. Usually, it does just does a pop song, yeah, or a song commissioned for the movie or something. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're right. I, I'm trying to think of like how many Paul Schrader movies do I notice like the score? You're right because it's usually like. It's usually like a fucking song that, like, like uh, Giorgio Moroder or whatever that he like did a bunch. Or you're right, it's like a pop song. Did First Reformed have no music? No, it had it had no music? ambient tracks by Lustmore. There's like three of them. I th- okay. think they're good. Yeah, when he's floating, when they use that B-roll, I think oh, there's yeah. something yeah. like ambient thing playing in the background. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. I'm trying. Oh man, now I'm curious. Are you guys excited uh, about uh, Paul Schrader's movie that's coming out in 2021 with? Uh, I think so. <laughs> The card yeah, counter? Tri- no, it's yeah. Girls Trip too. Oh. <laughs> do you think? Uh, do you think his desire for uh, that ranking of Asian women actresses, his search? Do you think that has anything to do with like Mishima too? Do you think he's maybe remaking <laughs> what Mishima? What if he pretended it was for so. a movie? What if he just wanted that list for himself? <laughs> <laughs> oh, dude, I can you dude, imagine the all-time Paul Facebook? Sh- by the way, yeah. Oh, yeah. I was so oh, sad yeah. when he was like, ah, oh, focus features. They told me I can't post anymore. <laughs> and then like two days later, he was like, I, he okay. was just posting it. He po- at first it was like, was I like- casted R- Rupert Everett because he's gay. Where do people get it? <laughs> Gmail.com. Like. Yeah, I mean, it was like pa- Paul returned after two days, like, two days like, I got to be me. <laughs> it was like a big fucking... <laughs> In his defense, that felt like a that felt like he didn't mean to post that there. It felt like yeah, he but he still used just, it as an entryway to get back to posting regularly. Now he's just I posting just, as often as he I wants. Just, just love that he's at that point of being old where he just posts things and forgets to delete it. My dad, my dad is like sixty five and uh, started posting on his stories about this thing that came out from. Uh, some Asian country about how you're supposed to turn off your phone at midnight because there's some radiation or some shit. And I was like, Dad, um, 
that that's from like 10 years ago and it's been debunked as nothing he was like oh oh okay but he doesn't know how to delete it so that's just on his stories for that's, 24 that's for hours, your singular wireless phone yeah that's for yeah. your cellular yeah. <laughs> is, your, is yeah. your father calling you to warn you about momo Hans, yeah. don't, Hans, don't do the Momo <laughs> challenge. I'm begging you, Hans. <laughs> he's uh, he's been uh, uh, telling me every day that I need to go to get a vaccine because uh, I need oh. to be. Uh, Is that why you're going tomorrow? Human. Yeah, yeah. Every oh, fucking because they've gotten it already, but you? every every fucking day it's just uh, just messages like I, I live with them and i still just text messages of like uh <laughs> you know tomorrow if you go at six in the morning and make a line there at the mall you might get it and it's just hans fine. you, you yeah. you've got to come back and just act like 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 non-verbally autistic you've got to guilt <laughs> them for like you <laughs> guilt them for like two days your, whatever you, you can do tell them you're gay <laughs> yeah <laughs> wait is it hard to get in costa rica what gay? The gay? No, uh, the vaccine. <laughs> the vaccine. <laughs> well, no, they're just they're just giving it away now. So tomorrow, I'm just supposed to do make a line at seven in the morning to get a a, a little thing so that I have a, I have a slot to get the vaccine. So okay, we're just oh, getting like okay. whatever is left over from you guys, I guess. Yeah, enjoy that mRNA delivery system. Huh? Yeah. Enjoy like that, that United States leftovers. We it's had it. Delicious. We had a big beautiful meal for the Fourth yeah. of July, and now you can have the scraps. Yeah, enjoy the bones. Yeah. Enjoy the bones. I love Trump, by the way, being like, Operation Warp Speed is a great success. You're welcome for the vaccines. But you know what? Maybe people don't want to take them because they don't like to do that. What does Paul Schrader's Trump movie look like? Oh, that might uh, be his first oh. truly bad movie. It would be. Uh. Is he going to make one? No, he said that he okay. wants to, right? Like, Who he's, would you? He's, who would you guys pick as a director to direct the the Trump? Movie? Uh, no one can I mean, do it. Oliver Stone. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, let's no, take a look no. at his W movie, and a, um, I, I I I feel like maybe the most honest version of that you probably get from Oliver Stone. Uh, I don't know. I don't have faith in his abilities these days, though. I'm interested in that JFK documentary he's got dropping soon. Oh yeah, yeah. Fuck, I gotta watch that too. I just want to see John Apatow's Trump. That would be good. <laughs> That'll Gibson. be good. That'll be great. You see Mel oh Gibson yeah, Mel Gibson. Uh, Trump at UFC. Yes. Well, yes. <laughs> what I was I was gonna. Go on, go on. Oh. I was, I was going to make a point about Paul Schrader. Like, there's something so... I was talking about this in our group chat today, just, like, thinking about the fact that, like, Paul Schrader is simultaneously an embarrassing old man... Like, a man with no self-awareness on Facebook. Like a, like, a retarded, old, horny man. And also, like, you know, less than four years ago, made one of the best movies released, like, in 2017. Like, there's... So, I don't know. There's, I, I guess, like, it's cool. I think that, like, I tend to, like, mystify directors as being like, oh, he's clearly a genius. He, like, eats, you know, drinks, breathes, like, his art. But that, that's just something that I love how much the curtain has been pulled back on Paul Schrader. I love that the dude who got fucking kicked out of his online poker game for being too horny made Mishima. Twice. Yes. Twice. Twice. The one that's, he's the just one asking that was... questions. The substitute group that was like, we got you, Paul. Come on on. We love you. We, we understand you. Kicked his ass out the same day. So that's the kind of guy we're dealing what with. Was I he, mean, what was, he, was he like creepy talking to the video poker lady that's yeah, on that webcam? Staring and licking that his is, lips yeah. aggressively. hilarious. If you, ah, I like him more. Dar can I ask you something, darling? <laughs> <laughs> what, do you, what do you think about your breasts? <laughs> yeah, what do you think about your own breasts? <laughs> I'm just trying to get information. Well, I'm doing research for a new movie that I'm working on. Could you rate yourself for me? <laughs> How deep is your pussy? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Everyone's you know, like, Paul, please fucking deal. Please. Yeah. Not until I get my answers. <laughs> Could you imagine hearing Paul's labored breath right under the crack of your uh. bedroom door? Because that's what Lindsay Lohan had to deal with, dude. Oh yeah, yes. She had to deal with his pug breathing right at the right at the foot of her bed every night. That's I think I think we him. talked about it in the last the guy... show we did on him. But that Canyons piece is ah, uh, it's it's a uh, it's a real piece of uh, masterpiece writing. Yeah. How did that guy... her, right? So how did Paul make all of them? Mishima and Canyons, and then first reform. That seems like such a like that's such a 
a uh, disparate curve of quality. Yeah, yeah. This I think it's film. I think it just comes down to money. Similar to Spike Lee, Spike Lee can make a competent looking movie if he has money and a real production company behind him. Yeah, Paul yeah. Schrader, if he doesn't have that production company or or someone taking care of everything for him, if he has more responsibilities on the set, you're probably not going to get a good movie out of that. Yeah, you're right. You're totally. But Spike Lee's a good thinking about like Red Hook Summer. Spike Lee's like a great comparison for that. That doesn't even look like a real movie. And a same with of, like, I, ooh, you should see like, the, I, the Sweet Blood of Jesus. I listen. I like Red Hook Summer. I got a poster of Red Hook Summer back in my home because I was like, this is kind of. I mean, I like the lead actor in that. I thought he he gave a good performance. But those child actors, holy shit! Looks like yeah. he just picked them up from the projects. Those kids couldn't act for to save their lives, <laughs> to feed I, their family. I, I, I like Spike Lee. I think he's actually a very important not to her. I, and I like most of his movies. I at least like find interesting. But a lot of his movies do look like shit, in my opinion. Like, you know, That's because he's a drunk. Look- That's because he's a low down, <laughs> dirty drunk. Spike Lee. He just shows up to class and starts saying the K word about you know people in New York. <laughs> I've oh, I've yeah. seen I've seen some things in some Facebook groups yeah. about Spike Lee going off the he shows up to teach a class and he's just wasted. He's just gone. Dude, oh, he's really he's right. wasted. He's another one similar to Paul Schrader. Like you see fucking twenty fifth hour, you see uh Jungle right. Fever, you're like this okay. guy do that thing, you're like, this guy's a genius. Then you watch him in the um the Fran Leibowitz doc. There's interviews where he's talking to Fran Leibowitz in that Fran Leibowitz documentary, and he sounds like he has fucking brain damage. Like he can yeah. barely speak. I'm amazed at how like complex and deep a lot of his depictions of race relations are in his films versus how he talks about race relations in his movies which are in, oh, yeah. in, in his interviews which are always just like completely you are a guy who you don't know anything <laughs> but in his movies he communicates like a very like complex it's like he makes it look very complex and, like, well it's, it's a lena dunham style thing right where you watch yeah. girls and then you 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 see who's really behind that, and it's like, wow, you're just a fucking retard. But <laughs> if you look at any of any of Spike Lee's early works, it's completely what you're saying. It's a very complex situation. I mean, you take a look at Jungle Fever. Good. I mean, even for a black filmmaker, good luck making that today. What's the lesson of that movie? Stay with your own. Wow. Yeah, what, that is what the, a filmmaker. It's insane. Yeah. It, yeah, Jungle Fever is a fucking. I mean, I like well, I like Jungle and, Fever, but and it's, Malcolm X is. But even Malcolm X kind of like it's kind of in I mean, it clearly is like standing Malcolm X, but it's like it shows the gray areas and complexities of him as a person and stuff. And then his interview about it on Charlie Rose, I'm like, he just like comes off like an asshole, doesn't know anything about it. Well, like, he's the guy's like, five... yeah, Malcolm X was badass. Fuck you. Like and then you went yeah. to five bloods and he's forgotten everything about that the five yes, bloods is bad dude i had to turn it uh, off oh i, I like the five bloods i like spike man i like i even like uh fucking summer of sam i think summer of sam oh no fun. that's I've a that's summer, a that's a fun one that's actually i heard I, summer I, of sam's I good that and i mean listen leguizamo is john leguizamo and that's probably one of his better Wonderful. performances yeah. to be honest with you uh but that movie you know there's some i guess wonky elements to it but as far as spike lee's canon goes I mean, that's that's really like the last good one before he well, maybe 25th hour, I guess. But that even has like hokey crash feeling elements to it. Um, but that feels like the like last of the, the, the Spike Lee 90s uh, texture. Yeah, I think to five bloods. I was just shocked at circling back. Some of it, some of the scenes looked great, like the old men partying in the dance floor. That was cool. But then the war scenes, I was like, this looks like a film school shoot. Mm-hmm. Mm. I was like, how how is this guy like not figured out how to film this kind of thing? And then there's also scenes that are not supposed to be funny, but are really funny. Like when the guy blows up and then he's just half of his <laughs> body on the ground. And you're just like, am I supposed to not laugh at this? This is so funny. I will say, I think maybe he was being tongue in cheek. I could see that. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe. I don't think so. <laughs> no. but but low, but i think low res is right about uh paul in terms of like it could have been some black comedy <laughs> hey come on <laughs> hey come on man yeah i, so I, I heard it. that he, cho- he shows up on set with a couple of cold 45s just wasted <laughs> <laughs> yeah man oh, yeah. hey are you guys looking forward to nope oh, oh, Jesus, oh. The, the answer you just said the answer oh. <laughs> nope you know i, mean, I find that no. I, I actually really saw us. What do you and, think? Uh, I, I, I don't know. You know I, I, I thought, I I thought like Tim it. Heidecker gained a lot of weight. That's what I thought. That's all I could think about <laughs> throughout the entire movie. He looks very puffy. looks very bloated. I thought the human va- it, the home invasion part was like genuinely pretty scary, but then it kind of just goes off the rail. Like It scared you, Robbie? Yeah, you felt scared, scared watching us? You were trembling in the can theater you ima- to this Can you movie? imagine that? 
Yeah, can you imagine black people in your house? <laughs> <laughs> black, black people talking weird with a weird voice? What? Yeah, I was scared yeah. from the beginning. Imagine renting out your vacation home to a black family. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was downright well, scared. The scariest thing for me was realizing that for every black person, there's another black person. <laughs> that there's twice as many black people as we thought. Oh my god, dude. Uh what a yeah like who, how does he title these mo like get out all right nope or us nope Maybe nope it nope like... it sucks dude that, i'm gonna i'm like... gonna make the call right now this is the fall off and it, it's setting itself up for that people are gonna want to write their nope <laughs> review you know that's gonna be the headline nope one and a half oh, yeah. stars no they're stars. gonna nope. like it jo jordan peele's a golden boy they're gonna it's it, instant 98 percent of ron tomato how did us do oh. how did i i know us did well critically but was it a fall off from get out no, it did really well commercially too. Us did but well, I think yeah. it's one of those things where it's like the first, like the second movie will do well no matter what because the first one was such a phenomenon. But this one better be good or else this one will bomb. Well, I do oh, so because I, Us was good enough. Also, it was good enough. Well, but we're starting weird shit. Us has ninety three, like, not ninety three percent of critics, but audience is fifty nine. Well, hold on a Whoa. second. Uh, oh. There, there are people that are going to trash. I mean, listen, you got to take into account for as many critics as there are that, that are going to suck his dick there's going to be people like you and i who are on twitter yeah. and all we do is gripe <laughs> about jordan peele and it's going to be one star no matter what just to say fuck yeah you. so yeah there's a lot of people yeah and it made it was a 20 million dollar budget that's actually surprisingly low uh and it made 255 mil million Damn. so it it, it it is it, it did do very well but i think it's like a thing of like uh people will see the next th like it's a Shyamalan thing unbreakable Actually, Unbreakable is good. I'm trying to think. That's a very good stuff. analogy. I, I see a lot of similarities between his career and, and Shyamalan's. And uh, I mean, this would have been so nope is, I guess, signs. I like signs. Yeah, I thought signs. I like signs like, might be well, his but best. his career, his career is more one note than Sh I mean, I guess Shyamalan's career is kind of one note, too, with like the twist thing. But like it's I feel like this genre of racial horror and, and there's like good examples of it. I, I thought Get Out was like pretty good. And then us, I didn't like. But like, do you guys remember that movie Antebellum that came out like last year? Yes. Uh, yeah. That that bombed. It didn't do well critically. It didn't do well at the box office. I feel, and even like you know, with fucking Lovecraft Country getting canceled, I feel like people are starting to see through this shit a little bit. I don't well, know how Candyman's gonna do. Like, because it's like I also think like the kind of movie that Hollywood's gonna greenlight about race is not gonna be like you're gonna hit the same note over and over and over again. Well, it's like what was that Amazon show that you? It was. Uh, I was about to mention that one. Yeah. Yes, yeah, we we yeah. had a lengthy discussion about this on an earlier podcast where it feels like. I mean, Jordan Peele has an executive produced Amazon series before that he had like no involvement in that Al Pacino Nazi hunter show. Uh, the title oh, was escaping oh me. Ooh. It was wow. Hunters. Hunters. Hunters is right. Hunters, I watched yeah. one Sent, episode of that. Of a Hitler. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> the writing on that show. N word here. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Jua. <laughs> Jua. They're all dark. Yeah. Jua. Yeah. <laughs> To yeah, the point I was going to make, though, before <laughs> we got into that. Um, the Them show feels like that was supposed to be Jordan Peele's executive producer, Jordan Peele. Damn, that show was so awoke that it listed the pronouns as its name. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize it was called Them. Yeah. Man, that's which is which feels like a riff on that's fucking us. I don't know. Yeah, us and them. Holy shit. It, it, all is, these... That, is, that cannot... The There's like a genre. Jordan Peele exploitation genre that exists right now. Ele They're ele all ele elevated horror, quote unquote, which is like a sh stupid genre, and it's all like racial. That's that social commentary. Yeah. It's horrible. I hate everything that's come out. I like to get out quite a bit, but everything that it has inspired sucks. It's a lot like Tarantino in a way, <laughs> you know? Yes. Uh, yeah, but it, it, but it would be like if. Tarantino fucking produced, you know, fucking suicide. It would be like if he had a hand in all the knockoffs. Right. Well, some and of his his also... movies that he produced are are downright terrible. Have you ever seen That's any true. Tarantino? I mean, we we know he was involved with It's Pat. He did a rewrite on that, right? Hell yeah. Because <laughs> oh, yeah, he no, was he... fucking only because he was fucking uh, Julia Sweeney at the time. He, Ew, he, he had a yeah. Um, that's why. Oh, that's why he. <laughs> that's why he rewrote that script. Could you imagine fucking Pat? You're fucking the <laughs> one who did Pat. 
That's he a man to creep. Not yeah. the foot stuff. The foot stuff is fine. He fucked you on Pat's really. feet. <laughs> Could you imagine doing that? <laughs> Tarantino uh, to you run about that right now. Uh, Tarantino run fucking the most annoying female comics of the nineties. He fucked Margaret Cho, Kathy Griffin, and Pat. <laughs> Jesus fucking Christ. But you're you're right, Laura. Tarantino, he's produced he had a production company that put What else did he produce? I didn't realize that he produced see. things. He's produced some uh, bad, bad movies. He's like put his name on bad movies. Now some, some, some of them are taste. deliberately bad. They're like mm-hmm. exploitation film bad, you know. Hostel. Um but I well, Hostel's probably like the the shining example of that. But there there's some pretty bad movies that he was involved with, uh, you know, either as a producer. Uh, oh, Hellride. Hellride is the one. It's one of the fucking worst movies you'll ever see. Hellride is terrible. And he put his name all over that. Oh, boy. oh my God. Well, I, just, I completely will, forgot about that movie. Yeah. He'll have like Dennis weird Hopper. tastes. Where, like I, I, he loves some movies that are just like like. Like it's charming that he loves a lot of bad movies, but when it comes to like making business decisions over what scripts he likes, like he'll probably go all in on just some mediocre bad trash, you know? Yeah, well, he. I think that he can. I love Tarantino. I think he's a smart guy. I think that when he talks about movies that are good, he takes a contrarian stance that like kind of fucking annoys me. Like, like you'll ask him like who his favorite directors are, and he'll say like, I mean, obviously he says like Sergio Leone, all these people, but Brian he also DeMar. says like uh, Brian. De- but he also says like Brian Trenchard Smith. Who is a guy who does? I think that's his name, Brian Trenchard Smith. He mainly does like, uh, like sci-fi, like made-for-TV movies and like asylum movies. And it's just like, I think you're lying, man. I think you're just saying this shit to be cool. He does hate Hitchcock, but I, but you know, I kind of buy it though. I don't think he knows. I think he's just autistic. Do you think yeah. he actually yeah, does, or it's a competitive thing where he sees himself on that? Because he was also speaking poorly of uh, Kubrick a little bit. And uh, admitted he didn't see Eyes Wide Shut, has no interest in seeing Eyes Wide Shut or uh, getting Kubrick's perspective on the subject matter of that film. Yeah, I think he doesn't I could, see. I could see him having a little penis envy that those guys will go down in history as better directors than him. Yeah. Uh, so he's a little mad that it's like he can't, he's not going to be able to crack Kubrick. But he said um, he hated Vertigo when it came out before he was even a filmmaker. Yeah. So. Well, he also like he's he's like shit on Orson Welles before publicly, but then also I think he like helped finance. Or no, he was at the premiere of Other Side of the Wind. I don't know. I think he has a lot of uh, too cool for school takes. That being said, I, know, I fucking man. love the Brian, guy. Brian Trencher Smith directed BMX Bandits. That's a banger. <laughs> that, BMX Bandits. <laughs> no, no, that it's one's awesome. actually good. Yes, I love that movie. It's it. I mean, maybe not for the right reasons. I did Dead End Driving. I love that movie too for the. Oh, it's damn. funny to trash. reasons that I'm supposed to. Yeah, uh, just trash. I know what Nick means. It's weird to trash like Hitchcock or Wells, but he sings the praises of the guy that directed music and lyrics and uh, like those other right. fucking Hugh Grant movies. Well, the director of Flipper from like the he 90s. likes being the he likes being the guy to sing the praises of certain directors that nobody else is talking about. But he likes being the guy to trash the the Golden Calves sometimes. Yeah. I don't know. What do you, uh, has he guys, ever said any? Uh, oh, what? Have you guys you think he likes the, Paul Schrader? Uh, uh, hmm. Maybe I, I. I could. I could imagine that. You know who oh, doesn't you know, like probably. Paul Schrader? Said taxi. He said Taxi Driver is one of his top ten favorite movies, so he probably does like him. I've received word that uh, another iconic filmmaker, Vincent Gallo, told me himself he does not like Paul Schrader or his film. Is this, Why? Is this when you were buying his pants? I mean, how this many? Was you... after, this was post pants <laughs> purchase. <laughs> <laughs> uh have you read his book Lores? the i think that's what you're about to ask uh yes i, I was gonna ask if you guys had checked out once upon a time in hollywood yet not no yet. oh I, not I, yet i got it I'm ready. I, I saw some excerpts where it was like uh cliff booth lists his five favorite kurosawa films and i was like <laughs> sure <laughs> i was like what? these are cliff booth's favorite yeah. movies <laughs> We're gonna be. Uh, well, I think we're gonna be doing a, a like a crossover oh, yeah. show on the on the book and the uh, the movie again at some point. Uh, and I've just been digging into it, and it, it's been very enjoyable thus far. But it doesn't feel like a novel whatsoever. It feels a lot like uh, just little vignettes of oh Tarantino's thoughts or maybe little short stories. It's not not particularly cohesive. Yeah, I, I think Booth's fa- f- favorite films are just anti Chinese people because he hates Bruce Lee. <laughs> well, it Tarant- is funny how hard he goes against Bruce Lee. Tarantino seems to hate Bruce Lee. He really does. I thought it was overblown until I listened to his Rogan, and I was like, "This guy fucking hates Bruce Lee." He how can him. you hate Bruce Lee? 
I don't know. He didn't oh. like that he was tapping American stuntmen. He thought Tarantino thought that was pretty disrespectful. I I, I I don't know if I got the impression he hates Bruce Lee so much as he just despises and wants the worst things to happen to Bruce Lee's wife. Or he's just, oh, yeah, I hope she gets fucking sued. I hope she gets sued and loses all her money and dies alone. Because she said this was, he came up with Kung Fu. No, he didn't, you bitch. You lying bitch. That's I mean, basically know, his Rogan interview. I do believe that Bruce Lee was probably kind of arrogant because he got his uh, yeah. sweat glands removed so he wouldn't, like, glisten oh, on camera. Wow. That's a real did fucking he, thing Bruce Lee did. I need to do that. Um, but uh, yeah, do you Hans, think he you was upset that. because he... Oh, you, Hans, you look very clammy came... and pale white. Like you, you already I, got your yeah. shot. <laughs> Listen, I just, I just came back from Vegas, and I've never sweated as much in my life as I did while I was in Vegas. So, oh fuck, uh, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm wondering if, uh, if he's upset because Bruce Lee got, you know, all of that attention and not being American in the '80s because he was like the Chinese person to go to, right? When it comes to fighting. Well, yeah, but then, but he fucking loves like. Uh, what you you mean? You uh, explain what you mean? Because he loves like Sonny Chiba and a bunch of other like seventies Chinese guys. Right. Right. I don't know. Maybe uh, maybe he wanted more of like a uh, blue Bruce. This feels very SJW. Uh... Like maybe he didn't like him because he's Chinese. <laughs> maybe that's what's it's anti Asian. Yeah, that's what it was. I'm try yeah. I'm trying trying to send out for my people for yeah, once. Yeah. Now you now you're starting to lean into it. Yeah. I used to I used to uh, be a, a little fat Mexican boy. Uh, thinking that I could be like Bruce, Bruce Lee one day and just because I wanted to die young. Uh, so I, I feel very identified with him. <laughs> My favorite thing about Hans, if you ever see, uh, you know, if you ever somehow come across his childhood photos, Nick, I don't know how that would happen, but maybe you just have him on hand one day. Uh, he changes races like every five years. <laughs> so yes, he does start as a plump Mexican boy, but then he's like a Chinese cop around the age of 12. He's got a military haircut. <laughs> And now I don't know where you're at now. I don't know what I would assume you are uh, if I just met you. Yeah, there was a time where my dad uh, wanted me to cut my hair like I was in the army, uh, but I was fat, so it was just my a chubby, fat face and a flat top. Kind of look like John Claude uh, Van Damme like in Street Fighter. Yeah, but fat. Oh yeah, but fat, which is with yeah. big, round, jolly cheeks. <laughs> look very happy, much happier than you are today. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Before I dude, knew the truth, you gotta send me these. I posted one, and he was like, hold on, dude, you got to take that. Please don't post that. Yeah. Like, you know, I got scolded. Fuck? Oh, you know what? I'll trade you, I'll trade you fucking embarrassing pictures from my childhood for embarrassing pictures uh, of your childhood. Oh, you have no idea. When I was 18 and just moved to Canada, oh, my God. I'm so I'm just glad that my MySpace profile was deleted because Jesus fucking Christ. Oh, dude, my, my fucking, my early social Whoa. media was insane. I was posting, uh, like, shirt, I was, like, a 14-year-old kid posting, like, shirtless photos of myself, <laughs> like, flexing, <laughs> writing shit on my chest like Jared Leto's Joker. It was an insane time. Flex my kids were straight were, edge. Were you yeah, straight edge, Nick? <laughs> I was straight edge, actually. I was straight edge until I fucking was not, basically. <laughs> You'd be straight edge at 14. You just, not, you just I, don't drink. I was... <laughs> just I, 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 I was... I was a... Yeah. <laughs> I, I was taking a stance against the other kids in my high school who were up to bad business, in my opinion. <laughs> I remember that I thought, when I was younger, that I thought it would be a really good idea and I would look very good. If I just had my hair wet at all times, so in high school, <laughs> uh, in high school, I would like um, ask permission to go to the bathroom just so I can wet my hair. And that that was my thing. I just, I a, I just had a wet God, hair damn. all the time. Yeah. It's, that yeah, it sucks, so dude. Yep. Uh, that is, <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I remember yeah. I met a girl from the Internet one time and I didn't know what to, I was so nervous. And uh, what I decided to do was wear like it was like July. I decided to, and I had to meet her in town, so I had quite a distance to go. I decided to, like, I was, like, panicking over my look. I didn't know what to wear, so I threw on, first of all, I threw on a flannel, a long sleeve flannel in July. And I was like, ah, yes. I don't know if I like this flannel. I'll throw on a coat. I'll wear a coat. I'll wear a trench coat. Ah, uh, what about my hair? I'll throw in some hair gel. Never wear hair gel. I just slick back my hair. <laughs> I look very greasy and sweaty the entire time. It was very, uh, yeah. very the wrong choice at all times. It still worked out because I'm a charming, no, that's amazing sounds man. That's true. The worst That's, I don't know, man. You the, sound pretty fucking cool. I got to be honest. The, the worst <laughs> thing you. about that was that I've had I've had thin hair my entire life. So at like sixteen, <laughs> so when I would wet my scalp? hair, yes, <laughs> yeah. So it was it was a lot of scalp and a lot of just hair just getting together in bunches because it was wet. It was terrible. That's why I was a virgin until nineteen. 
I guess. Hell, you were virgin until 19? Hell wow, yes, dude. that's pretty late. Yeah. That's Damn. awesome. I'm, I moved to Canada and fooled, I, fooled I was, the girl into 20, dating so me. So don't feel too bad. Yeah. Oh, I, I don't. What about you, Nick? I, definitely. Def- uh, when did I lose my virginity? I was 15. No, I, I was, was 14 six. years old. What's, it, what's, <laughs> his, <laughs> what's his name? <laughs> what's his name? Good one, Robbie. Thank you. We're just talking <laughs> about uh, painful social media experiences and, and early development I'm sure- problems. I'm sure Robbie has a couple of embarrassing early social media stories. Oh yeah, no? I used to post song. I think I used to just like post on girls' walls when I was like in high school. I forgot why. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, I, 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 it took me a bit when I first got to Facebook. It took me a second to not realize you shouldn't like old photos of girls that you're creeping on. <laughs> oh, you were just going back. <laughs> <to> oh no. <laughs> I will say, like in high at school, my, what are you gonna do? At my loneliest. <laughs> It's funny, man, because, like, I, so, like, I, like, <laughs> lost my virginity early, but then had, like, an incel period after, like, my high school girlfriend broke up with me where I just, like, nothing was working. So, at my loneliest, I would just, like, post, uh, not, I didn't have a cell phone. I would post my parents' home phone number on Facebook and be like, if anyone feels like calling me. <laughs> no, no. Oh, no. Oh, so, dude, so bad. I was in such a bad place. No, hold on, hold on. Uh, um, let me see if you can top this. Um. When I was in my teenage years that I, I never dated anyone and wasn't nowhere close because I was fat and autistic, um, I would hang out with my friends and their girlfriends because I would be funny. So I would entertain their girlfriends until they start making out and then we'd just go home. <laughs> uh, my, That's that right. sounds like yeah, a failed like, cucking experience. Like you're trying yeah, to be for, the, the alpha dom bull type and you yeah. just fail each time. Like oh, you're the for one. For a couple of years. Yeah, that was away. my role. Just like. Just like my friends will bring me over so that I could entertain their girlfriends before they would fuck them, and then I just go home in a bus by myself. So uh, wow, <laughs> yeah, yep, that sucks. Yeah, that's pretty bad. Yeah. What I used to do on MySpace, you know, I would like I'd have like a digital camera and I hang out in my room and I try to like take pictures of myself that look candid, like someone else took them, and uh, it never looked like that. It was just like me in a polo. <laughs> With wavy hair staring at the camera. With long, <laughs> it was really bad. With your long hair. Yes, yeah. that that version of me. That Hans is. I'll have to show you guys at some point. And yes. I would. I would. Oh uh, my God. I would perpetually. I want a it was, collection of these photos. Yes, just all of our <laughs> our childhood photos, our family photos, Nick's personal yeah. collection. Um, That's right. And there was a girl who had like the biggest tits at school. I remember I would I would rush oh, to yeah. be the first comment on her photos to be like, "You're the most beautiful girl I've ever seen." <laughs> and I remember. <laughs> I, I don't hung know out. why, but you're I, so beautiful. <laughs> I, uh, I didn't realize this was an abnormal thing to do until I was at her house one day because there was a party and one of her friends goes, oh my God, it's that guy who comments on all your photos. <laughs> And I, uh, I just like viscerally oh died in that oh, moment. Dude. That's, you know what? That's when you barricade yourself in the bedroom and you Mishima out. You just you take, <laughs> get your best friend to go in there and cut your head off. Yeah, dude. So. Um, oh. Well, I, I, I mean, what else can we say? Well, I mean, Mishima, I think I made the comparison on uh, your podcast, Robbie, for the premium show, but uh, Mishima is a very Gavin McInnes type figure. Ooh. I really do think there was potential there to live out the Mishima experience, especially on the, uh, you know, the Capitol Hill riot. And oh, that yeah, just didn't, yeah. that was unbecoming of Gavin. Instead, he's hosting a show for six viewers on uh, uncensored.tv, oh, firing oh. hosts yeah. by the day. Low you res. see that, and you're how, like, the Japanese are about, right. How dare you forget about the Wednesday uh, Compound Censored show with him and Kuma? <laughs> Every Wednesday on Compound Media. I, I don't <laughs> I know. I don't that. know how that could slip my it's mind. It's so funny where, here's the thing about Mishima versus, like, our, at least the alt-right figures I'm kind of, at least in the comedy sort. Because the far-right nationalists and Mishima seem to have at least some honor, you know, some honor and stoicism. The right the like alt-right people here are all kind of fucking buffoons like gavin oh, yeah. is a fucking joke and so is yes. Gumia, and so is uh milo baked alaska these guys are all colonel clinks and mishima was like kind of sick even though i, I don't yeah. agree with his policies uh, well i don't know dude you know what you give mishima if you if mishima had twitch there's no telling what he would be doing <laughs> dude mishima's poggers he Hold was, on. yeah. Um, <laughs> Nick, is that Don Cheadle behind you too? In yeah, yeah, he's the yeah, villain. He's the villain. His, the villain. his, his name is yeah. he's, his mean. name is Al G Rhythm. Al G Rhythm, the villain. He's algorithm. Oh, yeah. 
that's why the movie's great that, because that, that the movie hurt was made me, by like an physically, algorithm, basically. Physically yeah. hurt. That name. Yeah, Robbie has been on a Space Jam. Robbie has been Space on a. Jam. He's I'm pro Space pro, Jam too. I'm pro Space Jam too. I feel like I I'm losing my fucking I, mind. Dude. I think it's. I think it's one of the. It's one of the rare sequels that tops the original. <laughs> <laughs> Oh fuck me! <laughs> <Ugh>. <laughs> we should do an episode on Space Jam, the four of us. Dude, okay. I, I, uh, that that would force me to watch it. I really don't want to, but I I'll think say this: it goes down it. real easy. You, you won't have your phone out too often. It's, that is it's the most. That is not. It is true. the most. It is the most ADD <laughs> movie I've ever seen in my entire no, dude, life. No, so here, if you're autistic like me, I at some point like when the background comes into play. I stopped watching the movie because I was just trying to figure out who the fuck was in the stands. See how I, many films? How many films recently do you have to stop, rewind, and analyze? That's <laughs> why Space Jam Two. Yeah, is I think fantastic. that's my that's my that's my thing. I will just uh, what the two hours trying to look for Dick Dastardly and Mutley. That yeah. will be like my whole thing, just trying to find it that Warner Brothers fucking yeah diarrhea that the whole movie is. Yeah, yeah it, the fact that the nun from the Devils is one of the most prominently featured characters in the movie is fucking that is an x-rated movie warner brothers is that just what is that just them cheering on lebron so that he wins the game no no they're, they're the they villains do? they're all the villains so they're oh. cheering on i don't want i don't want to spoil the movie for you hans you should watch the movie right yeah there's a sure. lot of plot right. especially in the second half which isn't just a big basketball game there's a <laughs> lot of plot in the second half you need oh. to pay close attention guys i, I hate to Oh, I'm sorry. I hate to cut this short. No, I no. Uh, I have somewhere that I have to be, unfortunately. Oh, okay. Is it, oh, I'm okay. fuck. Oh God, I'm sorry. No, now I feel like a. Oh, look, now low risk. All right. Well, now I'm here. All right, I'll here. hang out. I'll hang out. That's fine. That's fine. Oh, you can I, talk. That's uh, fine. I'll put in some thoughts, some stray thoughts about Mishima. Uh, yeah. I I didn't understand. Well, I think when I first saw it, I I thought it was more uneven than it was. I was telling Nick, I think I was projecting because I don't think mm -hmm. I understood the time. Like I didn't I didn't keep track of the timelines very well. Did you guys have that experience? It's because it doesn't explicitly tell you what the what the co different colors represent. I mean the or even like yeah, what any of it really represents. So well, it took me a minute had, to realize kind of what was going on. I had never seen it until today. Like I saw it a couple of hours ago, and and that was one of the issues that I had, where uh, just uh, keeping my attention uh, because I didn't know. Like it, it kept jumping back and forth at the beginning. Uh, I did I did like the artistry of it a lot, and it kind of reminded me at, at times of that movie that I don't know how to pronounce that. Um, Cinedochi, New York, or or Cine oh, Synecdoche. 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 I like that, it. I like it. Sure. I like it way more than that. It's actually more like Dunkirk in a way, where it doesn't explicitly tell you they're doing different timelines, but they are. And I'm not a big oh. Dunkirk fan, but I don't know like... if I don't know if I agree with that. I think it's I think it's uh, the timelines thing is kind of. I guess it's not like there's no like. Um, it doesn't tell you. you I didn't know what was happening the first time I saw it. Oh, okay. Well, so I it wasn't expecting thing. Get... I wasn't expecting things to happen inside of a set. So when when they jumped into that and it looks like they're in a set with the, the houses, not not like a like a the, the let's say like a Japanese house in the wild, it just looked like inside of a set. That's what reminded me of, of that scene. In whatever. Synecdoche. Uh, well, the word, word. thing, I didn't realize the first time I saw it either that uh, those are, were representative of his works. I thought that was just weird scenes happening elsewhere. <laughs> and I was oh, like, All interesting. Right. Yeah, I just didn't. I didn't. I didn't get it. I needed to like see it, then read the Wikipedia summary, then rewatch yeah. it to like truly understand it. Yeah, it's uh, not your. It's not as innate a film as Space Jam: A uh, New Legacy. No, no, Space Jam. <laughs> I did. I got it. Space Jam. Space Jam Two. I it's got clear. the whole. I can tell you everything about it. I can tell you about. Well, is it not a lot of? Is there not a lot well, of subtext in Space Jam? 2? Well, here's the thing: LeBron's son. Well, the subtext is that his son wants to be a stop gamer. Stop it, Robbie! Stop. Well, his son. Hold on, because I did see, I did see like the first ten minutes of it. So I did see that one of his sons is like a, a fat nerd. Well, a fat, okay, so a fat you, nerd that designs video games, right? Well, it gets much more complicated than that, huh? <laughs> um, <laughs> Like yes, you scratched the surface. In fact, it might. I'm glad that you saw that because it'll be good for you to like reanalyze and pick up on things you missed before when you see it again. Okay. I love when we see young, <laughs> we see young LeBron playing Bugs Bunny's Crazy Castle on Game Boy. 
Oh my god, that fucking game stinks. That, you know what's stinks. awesome is that is, <laughs> it's so is bad. That he's doing that, and it's implied that he like knows what. But then he seems shocked at what the Looney Tunes are and what they do. Like he seems to not be familiar with that's the Looney right. Tunes. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> We talked about Mishima, and then we went back to Space Jam lower. Yeah. I was we wondering if you guys have just it. been literally talking about Space Jam for the past <laughs> no, no, four no, no, minutes. No, 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 no. no well, we I was talking it. about how, in many ways, Space Jam and Mishima are very similar. Yeah. You know, they're both very like Art Deco, fantastical films that do not don't it, stop it. See, look, there's kind of like three. It, they cut between three timelines much in Mishima. There's the real world. No. There's the AIG world, and then no. there's the cartoon world, much like in Mishima. There's the real world, the past, Robbie, and the Robbie. fantasy. <laughs> Robbie, and no, I think it's no. valid. Continue, Robbie. I'm very intrigued by this. In many ways, I have to say this. I have to get ways. this out. Space Jam 2 is not the same as Mishima. <laughs> Dude, I don't know, man. There's three timelines interwoven, and you really need to pay attention to like understand what's happening. And they're no, both Robbie. marked by they're both marked by their fi- their visual styles. Like Mishima, there is the present day very basic bones filmed like a regular film. There's the past, which is filmed like a <laughs> film from the past. And there's the fantastical nature of his work. Much like in Space Jam, in the real world, is shot yeah. like a regular film. Toon World is a 2D uh, cartoon. And then there's the AIG, which is more of a, you know, technocratic cyberpunk kind of thing. That's, uh, I, you know, you know. I, I don't know, Robbie. I think you're lying. <laughs> <laughs> I just like I just know that there's no other Nick, shows or anyone that I'm has wrong. made that connection at all between those two movies. Can you do uh, Looney Tunes back in action and Patty Hearst next? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, in, actually... in many ways, it's about uh, corporate greed. Both films. Well, yeah. Uh, I think we just happy. Have we reached I'm our peak in terms of Mishima as a <laughs> subject matter for this show? I feel like we basically yeah. didn't talk about it though. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> well, I feel like we've covered it before. I don't. He know. lived. It, he died. He, you know, his guts were still king. I don't know anything. Yeah, we, I guess we covered it. Yeah, it's a pretty light oh, what, what terrorist attempt. You know, he was what very about, polite to that soldier, even though he tied yeah. him up. Yeah, patriotism. that is true. I'm glad. Well, I, let me let me, let me throw this out to you guys before we get into patriotism, because we'll cut this. And then that'll be show number one. And then the bonus show will be patriotism. Um, do you guys think that he knew that that coup was bound to be a failure? And this was just like a swan song, that this was always intended to be a big theatrical death? No, because I think he thought of in terms of fantasy and what what uh, what unites all of his all the 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 the, the scripts that Schrader chose to include in the film or the stories. they chose, They're all super dramatic endings with like kind of perfect finales but then mishima's finale is not that so it's yeah. kind of like god god which shows you the nature of like art versus reality in a lot of ways and like the stark differences between fantasy and reality but and i i mean I, I don't come away uh, from mishima feeling like I, even though it was the coup was a failure there's something uh triumphant in the death i think with the, the the swelling of the score, and then you see the like the variations of that through the the fiction, I I I feel like uh, the death is a redemption as it's intended to be, uh, in the culture. Huh. Interesting. Yeah, you might be right. I mean, I'll be honest with you. I don't I don't really know a lot what Schrader's getting at. I just find it to be like the mood of the film and the look of the film and the vibe is really really good, really interesting. And I also just think it's like fascinating that there was this guy that like did this act and it's just like so obvious throughout his work like what he wanted to do and like he, he was like i don't really channel it through art and then he like followed through on a lot of the like his art in retrospect means so much it make there's there's such a darkness and depth to what to his art because of his eventual actions in real life that it might not have had if he hadn't have killed himself but he was still famous in his own right without having done that or right. you know committed terrorism right yeah i mean trader wanted he kind of wills his own personality and uh legacy into existence first through fiction and then uh by enacting those things in the real world like and this does tie right into patriotism but uh you know it's essentially the same thing Right. But obviously it's a more grandiose version in, in patriotism. And I guess that's kind of a failure. It's kind of a failure because people are like, whatever. And then you just kind of carry on, you know, like you, you accomplish it. But then like it doesn't stick. 
you know, like people's attitudes don't change just because you accomplish your goal. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll get into that for, for patriotism. So uh, where can people find you guys, especially you, Nick? What's going on with you nowadays? Uh, yeah. something, I've got something in the works. I actually, I, I don't know if I can stick around for the patriotism part because I fucked up. I double booked myself, but um, I don't know. Just follow me on Twitter. I've got a new project that I'm working on that you guys will see on my social media. It's just at Nick Oldershaw, Twitter and Instagram. And, uh, oh, watch the, uh, watch the final ever Coward Hour show. The Loud Boys were kind enough to throw it up on their feed and their YouTube channel. It was a blast. That was very funny. I, I, I didn't tune into that just the other day through the, uh, the Loud Boys feed. Uh, oh, cool. Great, great podcast. Very unfortunate that it had to come to an end. Yeah. That's yeah, okay. it's very funny. Maybe Coward Half Hour. You could you could do that. Yeah. So. That's you know what, I'm gonna do that. It was already that because Brandon was half a man's size. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, that sucks, man. Nick, are you ever gonna talk to Brandon ever again? No, he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> he died. He that's died right. in a yeah. horrible gay sex accident. He uh, crawled inside someone's asshole because he's little, and then he just yeah. died inside. Actually, like, Bre- I, I gotta be honest. Death. No, I can't. I can't talk too much shit. I can't draw a parallel between Brendan Crick and Yukio Mishima. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> as much as as much both, as I would like to. Both gay, both little Asian men, both yeah. men of honor and vengeance. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, man, Robbie? you should. Uh... Yeah, dude. Why don't you just like. Hit him up, man, Brendan. We're not, Robbie. Don't we're make, not gonna do. We're not doing make, this on movies, a podcast yeah. about the <laughs> oh, act fuck. of cinema. We're not gonna have this. I hold on. Should I, we give him a call wait, wait. right now? No, 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 no. <laughs> I actually. I'll tell you what. I actually have to leave because I've got. I've got to head over to this new podcast meeting. I'm sorry Brandon, to oh, Nick, Nick, do I, this. I just wanted to say though that <laughs> there's a film I saw named Space Jam 2 that's about wrecking silence. Oh! <laughs> what is coward hour in space jam 2 coward, if you look closely <laughs> coward hour is in space Much jam like 2 lebron and his son were separated by the dreaded algorithm uh nick and brendan are currently separated by for- exterior forces and lorez hans thank you so much for having me <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> mishima is a perfect movie everybody should watch it um <laughs> i'll talk to you guys later also check out space jam 2 <laughs> see you guys and the loud boys Check out the lab, boys. My Uber is here. I'm leaving. Right, right. <laughs> All right. That, that's been Nick Oldershaw. Robbie, you're much more popular than us nowadays. So people already know where to find you, Loud Boys. Uh, the show is a tremendous hit, and uh, that should be good. All right. People like, people like you now. Remember when you were freaking out? Yeah, Robbie, I read like some comments on the YouTube videos, and they were very hateful towards you. And that, that seems to have gone away. Yeah. No, it's still there. Someone like on one of them, they put like they wrote like a three paragraph thing, and they put timestamps of parts that they hated. Oh they no, like, timestamps! Oh my god! And I'll send it to you like right now. They're like at 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 three forty five. Robbie uh, does this thing I don't like, and then at seven forty eight, he does this thing I don't like. <laughs> I mean, it's not really dying down, but it, I mean, it's dying down, but it hasn't like completely gone <sighs> away. Like, it is a Fuck still- well, you YouTube I, people are always going to be terrible. So, but the I think the general sentiment has shifted. I think the air has shifted. So, I think that's in your favor, regardless yeah. of you know maybe timestamps as to you uh, you know annoying people. It feels very like I don't know if you well, guys watch Big Brother. But uh, sometimes, you know, if you get like a fat contestant on the show, what people will do on on Internet forums is do like a food counter where they just mark down every time the person eats food in the house. Yeah, Yeah. they do that sometimes. Well, it's just so yeah, funny they, how often I have to like objectively ki- like I'll do live shows where I'm like killing, and there's still people like Robbie's pathetic, and it's like, dude, you hear the crowd liking this? Like, I don't know what the fuck a, you want from me. Like, I'll, it's like I I don't know. Like, I really can't do anything to please these people. So I like it's I, the I, internet. I, I, I don't I don't think you can please everyone. I it, it doesn't matter how good you are. There's always going to be someone that's miserable that's going to. Well, similarly, you. it's interesting you're saying that, Hans. I've noticed people have turned on you, Hans, in our yeah. comment sections. Yeah. People, the charm for Hans has worn away where you were like haha you're gonna oh, say no. the thing that you know you shouldn't yeah. say in any context uh, now it's people people are like hans what is he yeah. he's, he wants to be a gay <laughs> prostitute for real we get i'm it. not <laughs> i'm <laughs> not serious enough for this show so i need i need to come up with better uh um arguments to the movies and why i don't like them instead of just saying they're gay so 
that's that's cool sure anyway that's, that's been this episode of movies tune in for the uh patriotism bonus show it's probably only gonna be like 20 minutes half hour long but it's on patreon.com slash lowers all right thank you for listening